Hi guys, welcome back to another Steam Free to Play walkthrough. Today we have Fall Streak Requiem for my homeland. And this is a game that I played the original way back in the day. And just as a warning ahead of time, these games are incredibly screwed up. Like I got super drunk, super immersed in it, and I start crying, bro. <laughs> like just bawling like a baby. Uh, so that's just a heads up ahead of time. If you do not like things that could easily trigger you, and some really mess. This is probably like the most. The first one was the most messed up thing I've probably ever read in my life. Um, so yeah, just be careful about that. But if you like the video, please like and subscribe. And I will try to play through this. I hear it's shorter than the first one, which is good because the first one was like eight hours of reading, and my like throat was like dying, bro. All right. Ooh. An ashen sky. The same as always. A thought crosses my mind as I look up at it. I'm still alive. Gathered around me were the limbs of other, the other children. A hand, a leg. There was no way to tell which belonged to who. Somebody. A voice, weak and small. Someone, please. I had been listening to it for a while now, listening as it called out, and was swallowed up by the falling ash. Anyone. It sounded so lost and lonely, so much that I shouldn't bear to listen to it anymore. Oh. Ah. I'm here. The boy's face softens at my touch. Thank you. Thank you. He squeezes my hand back. We stayed there for a while, with nothing but his ragged breaths, filling the muted world. But then he speaks, voicing the question I knew was coming. Did we do it? Did we take the hill? I look into the distance, where the soldiers we had cleared- Where the soldiers we had cleared a path for the, had been cut down. Where the enemy's flag stood, untouched. O oh, brave children of God, you will go forth and forge a path for the Lord's army. As you will guide the Lord's hammer upon his enemies, he will guide your steps to heaven, where you will join him in paradise eternal. Yes, our soldiers have taken the hill. Our flag flies high over it. Really? We... we won? Yes. The tension leaks from his body, and... He smiles. It was really scary, but I kept running forward. I'm glad. God must be proud of us, right? Yes. A nameless hill, one that was not even drawn on the map. This better not make me freaking cry again. <laughs> no, no, Jesus. Even as the ground erupted before us, we, don't, we didn't stop. And yet, old age, man, makes you so emotional. Thank you, kind sister. Oh my god, I was a girl the whole time. How am I supposed to know that? I think I'll go now. Everyone is waiting for me. The boy's eyes slowly shut. His hand goes limp. And something leaves him. Da -da 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 -da. The muted world became deaf and deafening once more. Only I was left. Only I remained. Once more, it fell from the sky. One of twelve calamities that plagued the land. Second calam calamity. Log logistic rain. The rain was always accompanied by a whirring sound, like a machine overheating. Those that did not find shelter in time were at the mercy of the searing downpour, which scorched deep into all it touched. It was wrong to blame the calamities for everything, though. Long before they dis descended upon the world, the land had been trapped in a spiral of decay. No future existed for humanity, which war, with war over the time remaining, being the reality that its last generations awoke to every day. The calamities were only hastening an end that had already been decided. That's not good. What's the point of taking a hill if y'all are screwed anyways, bro? You get people killed for no reason. It happened right before we deployed for a new battle. Fresh faces, nervous and eager, 
many, many even younger than those in my old unit. Before we could set off, we were brought into a white tent. There, attendants in white garments hooked us up to machines and asked us questions of all kinds. They separated us into two groups, one leaving the battlefield and one staying behind. One leaving for the battlefield and one staying behind. I was amongst the ones leaving, which numbered far fewer than those staying. For how long we traveled, I can't tell, couldn't tell. The armored vehicles we were placed in had no windows. We fell asleep to the rumbling of the engines and awoke to it. Having been, to having been told nothing, all we could do was wait and wait and wait. Until at long last, the engines rumbled to a halt. I can't see the sky. The familiar and unchanging ashen sky was nowhere to be seen. In that place where the light of day did not reach, people in white garments were buzzing about as if they were all part of a massive organism. Seamlessly, we became part of the organism as well. Flowing from hallway to hallway, valve to valve, chamber to chamber, halve to halve, the people in white bring us to a room. Once more, they hook us up to machines and ask us questions. The same questions over and over. The same answers again and again. They nod at their clipboards and whisk us back to the winding halls. We funnel into another room where they strip, tell us to strip and bathe. Our old clothes are discarded and we are given new ones. White clothes, just like they what they wore. Now we truly were a part of this place. Back to the halls. A new room. Physical exams. Test. Then, like clockwork, we return and enter yet another room. However, something was different. None of the people in white had followed us in. The room was utterly empty, save for us. As we stood, stand there, unsure of what to do, a monotone voice rings to the air. Initializing dimensional inversion module. Perceptual anchor coordinates established. Something was happening. Confirming intersection of complex space and corporeal plane. Instantiating a temporal corridor, corridor with the Sea of Akara. Something was coming. Localizing inversion to the fifth imaginary axis. Executing. Executing. But there was nothing we could do about it. Colors. They make my vision insane. A haphazard muscle, muddled stain. Red, blue, and green. Oh, green's my favorite color. I watch it wax and wane. And gather like a puddle of rain. Cyan, yellow, magenta. Racing, running through my veins. Burrowing deep into my brain. I'm sinking. In a world that had, that had lost its pieces. In a world that had been unwound like yarn. They emerge. Hundreds upon millions, thousands upon trillions, of what could have been, of what could have existed in my place. A me that was taller, a me that was smaller, a me that was neater, a me that was sweeter. One that was male, one that was frail. One with black hair, blonde, blue eyes, brown. A sea of possibilities that had been denied so that one could be realized. I could hear their raging sorrow, their howls and lamentations. Lamentations. Why had I been the one that was born as they were cast aside? Why had I been the one that was granted the privilege of life? In the face of their yearning and desire, there was only one thing to be done. Their cries did not reach me. Their envy and resentment did not move me. Ah, I remember now. The slaughter of possibilities. The genocide of what could have been. I have... I had taken to this massacre once before. I had taken to it and would continue to take it to it as many times as needed. Claim my rightful place in this world. Alert. Vital spiking beyond normal limits. Real to conceptuous. Stability index exceeding critical bounds. Second ring. Sector 4. 
Observation and Analysis Receptacle, A1. I was so tired, so exhausted. It was as if my body had been replaced with one hewn from lead. Even opening my eyes took all I had. At the edge of my vision, I could barely see that I could see the blurry outlines of figures rushing about, their voices stern and hurried. At some point, tubes had been attached to my arms, and a breathing mask had been placed over my face. But none of that mattered right now. Something was wrong with me. Something was missing. I didn't understand why, but I could feel tears begin to collect in the corner of my eyes. It ached so much. A gaping sense of loss and emptiness within my chest. What had happened to me? What had I lost? I don't know. Didn't know. I couldn't. At the moment, something envelops me. Something soft and warm. Someone was here with me. They hold me in their arms and stroke my head. Who? It was comforting. So unbelievably comforting. They couldn't have been anything more than a stranger, so why? Why did their touch feel so familiar? Unable to hold back anymore, the tears that had been welling up inside me break free and spill down my face. There was so much I didn't know, so much I didn't understand. But one certainty was all it took to wash it all away. Within their arms, I was safe. There was nothing to fear so long as they were here. I let myself sink into their embrace. Without a word, they continued to hold me, until my heart becomes calm and I sleep into a, slip into a deep slumber. Cold stilling, white light. I was in a room, lying on a hard bed. A1. Through the room, though the room had many cots, the one that was occupied was mine. The only one that was occupied was mine. I knew what that meant. The others had been in that room, had failed to claw themselves back. Only I was left. Only I remained. You're finally awake, I see. Oh, God, now it's a man. <laughs> Tell me who they are. <laughs> there was a man with glasses in the room. His face was weary and haggard beyond his years. I'm zero for two with guessing what the voice is supposed to be. I remembered the room being full of people before, but now there was only him and one other attendant. How are you feeling? I tried to rise from my bed, but my body was not responding properly. No need to push yourself. If you're able, to, there are some questions I'd like to ask you. I nod. Do you know who you are? Valor 26 P-E-O A call sign? The man glances at the attendant to his side. Provisional explosive ordinance. That lines up with what we have on record. The sector's consignment was procured from the Hypogean Theater. I see. The man's face softens as he looks down. Did you have any dreams? Visions that you saw after losing consciousness? A dream of sinking into bottomless depths. I couldn't remember anything about it except the vague sensation of swinging my arms, cutting, slicing into something, over and over and over again. Logos type, Marshall Branch, AP designation, tentative, subject to change, hmm, severing and separation. Let's try edged weapon specialization. The attendant nods, her fingers dancing rapidly through the air. That should be enough for you to go off. Please take care of the rest. The man rises from his seat. But before he leaves, he seems to pause and hesitate. There's probably a lot you're confused about right now, but well... I have time for a question or two if there's something you'd like to ask. There was just one thing. One thing I wanted to ask more than anything else. There was someone who comforted me while I was sleeping. A woman with white hair and red eyes. Do you know where she is? I... I want to thank her. No, that wasn't the entire truth. More so than wanting to thank her, I longed for her. I longed for the peace and ease I felt within her arms. 
There was nothing I wanted more than to be lulled to sleep by her rhythmic caresses. To slip into restful repose, cured in her warm embrace. Oh, that's not possible. No, forget I said anything. Spectral Mitten turns away. I have a lot to see to, so I'll be taking my leave now. He leaves the room with hurried steps. I looked to the attendant, but she didn't seem to understand his reaction either. In any case, please try and get some rest for now. We will be asking much of you going forward. Chop. Chop. Once more I was here. Oh, it's chopping for me. Gotcha. An empty room with table, a table in it. A stack of white blocks and a knife. Once more, I was cutting the white blocks. Oh, well, it sounds like we're good at it. It had been several days now. For the entirety of it, I had been directed to continue this repetitive task. While mind-numbing, I also found it soothing in a way. Eventually, the simplest movements become me. Another day. Once more, I had been taken back here. But something was different. While the stack of white blocks had been replenished, there was no knife. What is the matter, 2-6? As if in response to my pause, the intercom buzzes to life. There's no knife. All required materials have been provided. Please continue as usual. When I look back, I find the knife in there in the same spot as always. Oh. I must have missed it before. Taking the knife in hand, I sit and begin cutting the white blocks. I let myself become the familiar movements and cessations again. Just like that, another day passed. Having cut all the blocks, I passed to place the knife down. Excellent work, 2-6. To clarify, you were not mistaken in your initial observation. No knife was present when you entered the room. We did not provide you with the cutting implement this time. Huh? When I blink and look down, I find the knife nowhere to be seen. All that could be seen were, was a pile of neatly cut white blocks. Your aptitude exceeds its preliminary projections. We will now proceed with your training and instruction. Conceptual dissonance, a phenomenon in which the user projects an internal vision upon the world, forcing reality to warp in order to accommodate it. Only those that had survived exposure to the Sea of Akero were capable of it. As for what the Sea of Akero was, in the most general terms, it was a mist of possibilities that ran parallel to our own dimension. The convergence of the Sea of Akero on the corpor corporal plane many years ago is believed to be what precipitated the Earth's decline. I learned all about it during instruction. I learned about the church state of Sylvine, which sat on the very cutting edge of research into conceptual dissonance in the Acheron Sea, the human preservation mandate which spearheaded research efforts in this sprawling facility located under Sylvine's capital, the Cathedral City, the protracted war of attrition that humanity have found itself locked in, and how the HPM intended to break the dreadlock through the application of conceptual dissonance to achieve decisive victories. Destruction was comprehensive in all matters pertaining to combat. Whether it be through direct neural upload or intensive drilling and memorization, every facet of every applicable field had to be deconstructed and internalized. The material composition of contemporary heavy armor, the chemical reactions that governed high yield explosive munitions, everything I knew had to be relearned in its most effective and efficient iteration, breathing and respiration, from the trachea all the way down to the alveoli, oxygenation and hemodynamics, from the heart all the way to the capillary, hand in hand with instructionless training, wound reconstruction constitution, low-profile projectile nullification, shaping the world as one will through CD demanded absolute mastery over the fields of theory being invoked. 
It was not enough to simply understand. Thought into form, wrote into reenactment. Every day, I pounded the movements and metho methodology I needed into my body. Every day, I drew closer to expertise. Hack, slice. Split, sever. Separate. Oh. Until the time came for me to return to the battlefield. Hmm. Operation Oblast. Day 267, 629, 001. Hey, 17 kilo. Too much to read. Too much to read. Too difficult to read. I just know we're going on mission. The muted thumb of the aircraft engines was the only thing that could be heard. Every foot we traveled brought us closer to that place. Every second that passed, we drew closer to the promised time. The place that we're going... Is there something you left behind there? It takes me a moment to realize that she's speaking to me. Something I left behind. Yes. Then let's take it back together. She reaches out and wraps her fingers around my hand. Only then did I realize how tense I was. Exhaling deeply, I calmly calm my breathing and still my heart. <sighs> That's right. I wasn't alone. Just like on that day, I had comrades at my side. But this time was different. Sky roars as the hangers open. Hangar door opens. There was no need to think anymore. The outcome had already been decided. I had written it with these very hands. The wind whips at our faces as we fall. As we descend, searchlights and ATS lasers flicker, flicker to life around us. Like taut threads, they snap and fizzle out before they can illuminate us. Plunging through the cloud line, we scatter and peel off it as AA battery fire lights up the sky. Anti-air battery. <laughs> AA battery. Oh, Anti-air. Gotcha. As the air, <laughs> earth races towards me, I hold out my hand. My chosen blade heats my call, wisping into existence at my side. In the distance, I could see my objective, a nameless hill that was not even drawn on the map. The moment I hit the ground, I take off towards it. Fire and still converge on me as I press forward. The pounding of machine guns, the eruption of proximity mines, none of them met their mark. Their flames could not touch me. They still could not reach me. Forward, forward. There's nothing that can stop my advance. As I near my target, I take my sword in hand, and with one singular stroke, sever myself from the past. Did you really have to cut the mountain in half? Really? We didn't take the mountain, we cut the mountain in half. That's not... Two different things, I believe. A month had passed since the completion of Operation Oblast... I don't know how to pronounce that. Army Group Center had taken advantage of our breakthrough to push through the tip of the Gal Salient. They had been then proceeded to circle back and envelop its flanks, where the enemy had concentrated forces in preparation to pinch off the salient's neck. Over the last month, the prototype sec CD section had provided support in neutralizing the remaining pockets of resistance. With the enemy front line, enemy's front line all but collapsed now, we had joined the army on their march to the capital. For the time being, though, we had pitched camp, giving us much needed reprieve from the stop from the non-stop fighting what are you doing hmm load in 75 her specialty was crushing and compression making her an invaluable ally when it comes to neutralizing heavy armor and fortifications while our unit has suffered its share of casualties as well it seemed as she had made it through unscathed i'm eating yeah i can see that but oh, where's your veggies, your meat? You're not just going to eat hardtack for dinner, are you? No, I have some nutrient blocks to supplement it. Uh, I guess that works, but isn't that a bit depressing? She seemed disappointed for some reason. Come to think of it, we hadn't, haven't gotten the chance to properly introduce our, each other with all the fighting going on. I'm Dina. What about you? Is that that girl's mom? The... 
Is that the special girl's mom from the end of the uh, last one? Ah, uh, please don't go back there. I don't need that in my life. Failure 26. No, I know your call sign already. What's your name? Then, Baylor Sylvine. So this is like a prequel, I'm guessing. Huh, well, ain't that a doozy? It has to be. The way she's talking, it has to be. Whatever, I'll just call you Val. You remind me of one of my little sisters. She was always a bad girl who never ate her veggies. Or was it her sister? I don't know. Say, ah. Uh, what? Before I can react, she shoves a spoon into my mouth. Come on now, chew and swallow. If all you eat is hard tank and nutrient blocks, you'll be get constipated. There was a mess kit, tin nestled in her arm, that she had apparently been carrying all this time. Well, how is it? It's pretty good. Isn't it? The components seemed to be nothing more than our usual rations, but the texture was pleasing. The flavor as well was subtle, but appetizing. Did you make this 7-5? Yup. Also, call me Dina. But... Dina... <laughs> Alright. Come on, let's hear you say it. Dina. There you go, good girl. He pats me on the head. Oh, it has to be your relative. I didn't know whether to gesture, find the gesture offensive or endearing. I made this veggie crumble by combining different parts of the MREs they give you. For the crumb, I crushed up the crackers and nut packs. It helps balance out the texture of rehydrated veggies. I usually don't like vegetables, but this isn't bad. I wonder if this person's a soldier, the Ryger, because they know a lot. They know a lot. <laughs> oh no, don't tell me you're one of those people who never season their veggies and then complains it tastes bad. There's not much in terms of spice to work with, but if you mix and match the flavor packets you get from different filled rations, you can make do. Oh, so you're rat fucking the MREs? Is that what- oh, language. Well, this is gonna get bad anyways. You rat fucking the MREs, Dina? <laughs> I see. You want some more? I'll have some. Go ahead, eat up, eat up. She seemed pretty happy. You're from the main facility under the Cathedral City, right? Mm-hmm. No wonder you knew our objective was to... back then was to capture the hill, right? Didn't you... Th didn't think you'd lop the bloody thing in half like a stick of butter? That's what I thought, too. It's true that nothing in our mission specs entailed bisecting the hill, but... We were told to use whatever means necessary to complete the objective. <laughs> what are you getting embarrassed about? Might have been a bit extra, but it sure got the job done. I'm glad there's someone close to my age here, though. There wasn't anyone like that in the branch facility I came from. I wonder, so Valor's probably the white-haired girl's mom. Alice, I think her name was? And I think her sister was Sophie. I don't know what... Uh, I'm trying to go from the memory, but it's been about a year and a half. I didn't know the HPM had secondary facilities. Yep, I recruited myself because, well, I didn't have many other options. My family went, all went ahead of me, after all. I see. It was hardly an uncommon story. I was just going to sign up for the army at first, but my parish wanted me to take a CD aptitude test. I guess that's why I'm here instead. What about you? What's your story, Belle? It's nothing that interesting. Hmm? At some point, what looked like two children had wandered into the vicinity. Refugees? They must have been lured here by the smell. Come here, you two. Dina beckoned them over to us. The two children shuffle over timidly. They look to be siblings, or at least related. Is it the two children from the last game? Hungry, are you? Well, today's your lucky day. Their faces light up, and the boy reaches for Dina's mess tin. No, he's got his voice. It can't be the same one. However, the only thing he receives is a sharp, swift chart to the head, forehead. Now, now, don't get too hasty. When's the last time you two ate? The boy looks to the girl, who seems slightly older, but she only shakes her head. I don't remember. 
In that case, here's what's for dinner. Dina hands him two tear open packages of what looked to be a fortified peanut paste. Since you two haven't eaten in a while, your tummies have forgotten how to work. That's why if you eat normal food right now, they now they'll explode. Eh? That's not how it works. They're kids, Vale. If you want them to write them a thesis on re refeeding syndrome and RUTFs, be my guest. Listen to the nice lady or your stomachs will explode. Oh, okay. Anyways, for today, just eat this paste. That will help make your tummies remember how to work. I'll pack up some normal food too, but you better wait until tomorrow to eat it or else kaplute! <laughs> the children nod gravely and open their packages. But before they bite in, they clasp their hands together. Blessed be the God who is our bread. May all the world be clothed and fed. Amen. Oh, you two know how to save grace all by yourselves, huh? There, there. Dina gives them both a quick head rub. Here's your food for tomorrow. The rain's been falling a lot recently, so take ponchos with you as well. They have a special weave that can protect you long enough to find shelter. <laughs> They're a little big on you, huh? Thank you, kind sisters. May the Lord watch over you and keep you safe. The children offer a small prayer before departing. They're even though they're children of an enemy nation. Of course. At the end of the day, everyone's trying to live with all their might. Isn't it just human to help? To want to help when you see something like that? It's hard to just stand by and watch. In fact, our CO had actually given us clearance and encouraged us to assist any refugees we encounter. Commanding officer. The reason that we fight is to save those who have lost their way, right? That is the church, church's guidance. A holy war in the name of God. A just war to unite and divide the humanity and reclaim our future. The church has always been there for me and my family. That's why I want to believe in their words. I want to have faith that we're doing the right thing. Enough of the, that talking, though. I want to hear what your story is, Vale. I'll tell it to you some other time. We should turn in for the day. True, we should rest up while we can. You want to sleep together, Vale? Sure. Phew. I have to take a break. <laughs> I'm not so good at reading as long as I used to. And I don't have any alcohol. The successful unveiling of the prototype CD section has given our forces a surge of momentum. Hailed as the end of attrition warfare and return to maneuver warfare, our breakout at the Gal, Gal Salient did much to galvanize morale. There was much, even talk that we could capture the capital and close the curtain on the Hypogean Theater by the end of the month. However, none of us could have foreseen what had awaited us on our march. Wasteland, as far as I could see. Terrain that had been ravaged beyond recognition from the passage of the Calamities. And dead zones caused by the late sea convergence of the Upcaran Sea. The enemy was quick to adapt to the threat that the prototype CD section posed. The prototype CD section was a small unit that could only be deployed in one place at a time. By avoiding direct conf conf uh, confrontations, and large-scale entrenchments, the enemy was able to severely limit our effectiveness. Instead, they resorted to stalling tactics, demolition of roads and passages, traps, area denial, and scorched earth, raids and sabotage on our supply lines, which had been spread thin due to our rapid advance and the massive amount of territory that had, been, had to be covered. The march to the capital was simply too long, with the the enemy's familiarity of devastated landscape giving them the in initiative and engagements, like when the Germans try to go into Russia, what this reminds me of. Battles were often small, lasting no longer than a few minutes before the enemy retreated. But their frequency and unpredictability prevented us from getting a solid footing. Even though their combat casualties numbered far, high, far higher than ours, they were succeeding in slowing us down. And the more we spent marching through the wasteland, the more we slowly bled out. Alright, I'll be right back. I gotta get something to drink. Six months had passed since our breakout through at the Gull Salient, Gal Salient. 
Our battle was against the land just as much as the enemy. Harsh fluctuations in weather, hazardous terrain, and the incessant threat of the calamities. The pressure is applying in conjunction with the enemy's relentless skirmishing was taking its toll on our forces, excuse me. That's the last of our APCs. APCs? Armored personnel carriers? Oh, I don't know. Looks like it's LPC the rest LPCs the rest of the way. LPCs? Leather personnel carriers. Oh, I was right. Armored personnel carriers. <laughs> Very funny. In other words, boots. Tough crowd today, huh? You know, I remember when it used to rain water instead of hot unicorn piss. <laughs> no, you don't. That stopped happening before we were born. In the good old days, this here sky were as blue as a flaxen maiden's eyes. It's true. Back in my parish, we had this really old guy, basically a breathing bag of bones, that didn't know how to kick the bucket. All he ever talked about was the blue sky. Well, at least when he was, wasn't yammering on about what a looker his late, light, what, late wife was. We kids asked him if he could see one thing again before he died. His wife or the blue sky, which we would choose. You know what the old geezer said? My wife, because you could see the boundless blue of the sky in her eyes. Real romantic, right? But then he moaned and said, Ain't nothing. Ain't nothing that made me happier than painting clouds on that sky of mine. <laughs> Dina, please. Now, mind you, we were nothing but a little bunch of little Lillens at the time. And you know how kids parrot every last thing that goes through their ears. Later at the dinner table, my mom asked me why we keep going on about painting clouds on skies. We tell her about what the geezer said and she just goes dead quiet. Then get this, my little sis asks with the most innocent face. Mommy, does Pat Pat clou paint clouds on your sky too? <laughs> At this point, my pal... Pops, who had been trying his darndest not to laugh, just starts howling. <laughs> you, <laughs> you should have seen the look on my mom's face. Red as a beet. <laughs> my parents wouldn't explain anything and just told us to stop saying it. But obviously, we're going to keep doing it after seeing how funny their reactions were. The next day, we were just running around the town, screaming at the top of our lungs, We're going to paint clouds on your sky! And all the town folks just smiled at us, and thought we were ador being adorable. <laughs> huh, made you laugh. S shut up. <laughs> we're in a war zone, <laughs> for heaven's sake. That's exactly why it's important to laugh. You won't be able to keep going if you don't. You gotta embrace the suck, Val. They had to be in the military. They got it. <laughs> Sucks to suck. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure. Oh, they were very researched about it. Very learned. I know what that means, but I don't like it when you say it. <laughs> Shaking my head, I gaze up at the unchanging ashen sky. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? I think it's a nice reason to fight for seeing the blue sky again. Or is there some reason that you fight, Val? I'm okay, just fighting for your sake. What? What's that supposed to mean? It's easy to talk about ideals and greater causes when you're standing around like this. But in the heat of battle, it's hard to think about anything but who's in front of you and who's at your side. I don't really care about carry any grudges against our enemy. So I'm okay just fighting for the comrades at my side. I... I see. But well, I guess I wouldn't mind seeing this blue sky of yours. Right? I think it'd be nice. This unchanging ashen sky. It had not always been this way. Just like how it changed to become like this. Maybe, just maybe. Dina notices at the same time I do. Uh-oh. Nodding at each other, the two of us dunk, duck and melt into the shadows. Two unknowns, inbound. 
They're limping, wounded. Unarmed too, from the looks of it. Refugees? They look like non-combatants, but be sharp. The fact they were approaching in clear view meant they were, likely weren't hostile. There was no good cover or vantages nearby that any bush, am, that an ambush would, could be launched from either. Oh god. Someone, please, help. Help us. It's a trap. They're just kids. It's a trap. Dina, wait! Uh, it hurts. Uh, it hurts. Blood was dribbling from where he was clutching at his side. These injuries, who did this to you? What happened? I, I don't know. They put us to sleep and when we woke up, they're bombs. G oh god. Dina lifts a boy's arm, revealing swollen, t swollen tissue and su surgical sutures. It's a bomb! Go! What? Showing Dina aside, I grab and throw the boy as hard as I can. Ah, goddamn. Mm, 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 mm. God, how could you be so complacent? What the f- Oh my god, woman. I know they're kids, but damn. Mm. The world turns upside down. As I struggle to regain my bearings, I hear a voice of Mr. Ringing. At least we got a- uh, Oh, shit. Caleb, where did you go? Caleb? Stumbling to her feet, she looks around in a daze. Sisters, did you see where he went? Oh, God. Stop right there. Don't come any closer. Wh why are you looking at me like that? Uh. Cradles her side, where stitches could be seen as well. Dina, get clear from her. You're too close. In the background, I could hear screams as multiple explosions reverberated through our encampment. Dina! What's going to happen to me? God, I hate this shit. I... I don't... Stop. Help? Help me. Mm. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad I'm not drinking. Oh. Mm. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus Christ. Dot, dot, dot. You're still awake, aren't you? Val? A relentless, relentless, restlessness has taken a hold of me. I had not sustained any significant injuries, but for some reason, it felt like I was covered in blood. I'm sorry for being so weak, for forcing you to do that for me. I could see it when I shut my eyes. We're playing endlessly in the dark. It's okay. I could see her pleading face streaked with tears. Her outstretched arms. Her head would fall from her shoulders, the rosary in her hand dropping to the ground and becoming stained with blood. I'm fine. But no matter how much I tried, I couldn't calm down. Belle? Dina wraps her arms around me and pulls me into her chest. Listen to my heart and feel my breath. It'll help your body remember its normal pace. Her heartbeat was warm and steady. Her breath cool and intermittent. Intermittent. My mom used to do this for us when we were down into the shelters. I was reminded of the woman with white hair that once held me. Perhaps it had only been a dream, but the memory helped still, helped still the water surface. Eventually, the ripples subside, subside, and the darkness turns back into darkness. The two of us lie there, for a while more, before Dina breaks the silence. How did you know? Will you tell me? D.E.O. Visional Explosive Ordinance. You probably did it yourself. For this, I was a child soldier of the church. There was no shortage of abandoned and orphaned children between the war and the calamities, after all. They called them surgically implanted IEDs, or bod body cavity bombs. 
Their visibility was low compared to explosive vests, allowing us to blend in with wound wounded refugees. When the enemy crossed paths with us, it was simply a matter of getting as close as possible. That was the role we were given. That's... I was the next in line to be implanted, but by then, the enemy started killing refugees on sight. It was deemed a waste to continue expending munitions on us. So we were repurposed as human wave attacks to clear minefields of ahead, advanced, ahead of advancing units. When our role became obsolete, we were simply assigned a new one. Why didn't you tell me? That's not a good thing to talk about. <laughs> like, is it because I told you I wanted to believe in the church? Uh, no, probably not. It's probably because that's not something you want to share to share. Is that why you kept your background from me? From me? You really do remind me of my little sister. Carrying all that weight inside of you. Because you're too kind. Dina. I... I want you to stop thinking about that. About whether or not we're doing the right thing. Why I, had I said that? I didn't know. But it was probably because I was afraid. Afraid of what li laid ahead of us on this path. I can't do that. That's right. There was only one, ever one answer she would give. It's the same for you, isn't it? No matter how much you try to armor your, armor your heart. No matter how much you try to turn cold and hard, you'll never be able to grow numb to it. So long as you remain yourself, it'll always hurt, cause you pain. Cause that's just who you are. A fool who thinks about others, even when you're the one hurting inside. Why had things turned out this way? The answer was neither meaningful or nor profound. Perhaps we were simply desperate. Under the unchanging ashen sky, something was burning. Something was being lost. Those were... There were those that tried to hide. Their homes would be barred from the outside and set on fire. There were those that tried to run. Their bodies would become riddled with holes and carelessly kicked aside. Then there were those that prayed. People who clasped their hands and faced the sky, their lips moving in earnest prayer. Their heads would fall from their shoulders, the rosary in their hands, dropping to the ground and becoming stained with blood. Everything that could be taken was taken. Everything else raised to the ground. A soldier marching at our side had fallen, yet no one batted an eye. Why he had fallen, the reason was easy enough to imagine. Whether or not we had the supplies to treat him, that didn't even take imagining. Whether or not we had supplies to treat him, that didn't even take imagining. In this land, where being left behind meant dying, where being close to death was the same as being dead. Stopping meant forfeiting your life. And so we did the only thing that we could. March forward. An unending cycle. How many times had the scene repeated itself? I wasn't sure. Had long lost count. Motionless bodies, burning houses. People kneeling in the streets, with their hands clasped in prayer. And yet, those people weren't saved. There was no one to save them. The living became the dead, the moving became unmoving. Everything was sent back, delivered to the Lord, for the sake of this holy war in his name. A soldier marching at our side had fallen. Today, the storm was dyed a pale blue, the fourth calamity. Hyperoxian dust. There was nothing we could do. He had damaged his respirator in the last battle. It was neither a peaceful death nor one at the end of a natural life. He kept coughing up large amounts of blood. Finally, after a painful struggle, he could no longer breathe. There were no final words of prayers, just gasping and gurgling. We watched his last agonal, agonal breaths blankly before turning away and continuing on. Nothing remained of the people that first set off on this campaign, 
eroded by the dust and buffeted by the wind, we were nothing more than protrusions in the land. Nothing but hollow husk with darkly clouded eyes. To march ahead, we existed for that sake. That was the role we had been given. As our bodies wasted away and our flanks, ranks slowly dwindled, we continued on our dead march to the end of the world. Stone to sand, a castle on the shore, worn down by waves. Oh, she's the one that blew it up. It happened as we were sieging the sunken capital. The heart of the enemy nation we had slaughtered, countless and lost countless to reach. Dina. She fell ill with prism corrosion syndrome, a death sentence of the first calamity. She had just one request as her body withered away. Take me to the top of the wall. I want to see it. I didn't want to bring her. The end of our journey, the result we had struggled so long to bring about. I didn't want her to bear witness to it, and yet, under, understood. God damn! Ah! Oh! <laughs> As I climbed the capital's walls with her arm on my back. At that time, somewhere something hurt, felt painful. Blood was flowing, deeper, stronger than being cut by with a blade. Ah! Pumping, spurting without end. It was wetting my footsteps. I didn't want to take her. So why had I agreed? Perhaps somewhere in my heart I was hoping. Hoping that salvation was what we brought to the edge of the world. That was what I hoped, and yet... The sight that awaited us was anything but that. Flames as far as the eye could see. Burning churches, burning people. Women stripped off their clothes, defiled, dismembered. There's nowhere left, nowhere to run. Among the remaining, there were those that resigned themselves to fate, bringing their hands together and facing the sky above. Then there were those that fought. <laughs> Children who crawled out from their mother's corpses to continue to the fight. Elderly whose arms could barely support a rifle without shaking. Desperately, with all their might, they struggled. As they were slowly, methodically, cornered and crushed. This was no holy war. This was a war of annihilation. Lacking mercy or compassion, nothing filled the streets but cold extermination. How does it look? I can't see very well anymore. Our forces have liberated the capital. The remaining garrison has surrendered peacefully. The fight's over. I see. She let out a long breath. Uh, what kind of face was she making? That fr body frail and gaunt from disease. Then with this, they'll be saved. Something fell against my neck. I wish I could believe that. Drip, drip. Something hot and wet. I searched for the words to say in response. Should I deny it? Should I admit it? Should I try to comfort her or speak of something else? My nosy, nosy, stubborn, stubborn partner, who always fussed over what I ate and told me stupid stories to make me laugh. That foolish partner of mine who fought and bled alongside me. For her, I tried to find the words. Words for my dying friend. But it didn't seem like I could find those words. Why? There's nothing left. Atonement. Forgiveness. They were no longer things we could even speak of. Nothing remained but the regret and despair of what we could never take back. I'm sorry, Mother. Father. Little Patrice. Or Ernie. It seems... I won't be able to join you in heaven. It was too cruel. The weak tremors against my back were filled with pain and loss. 
I didn't want her to suffer anymore. I didn't want her to go through anymore. On top of that wall, overlooking the flames, I placed her down. We had long run out of morphine, so this was the only thing I could do for her. Bell? My hand shook, as if I was holding the blade to my own neck. Where did you go? Bell? I knew. By doing this, I couldn't return to who I used to be. I knew that, but... I'm sorry, Belle. I just... wanted her to be free. Oh, God, I need a cigarette. Good <laughs> lord. Uh, I don't even smoke, boy. If God was truly out there, there was just one wish I had. Please, bring those I killed to heaven. I didn't need salvation or forgiveness. <sighs> Only one prayer could be made. Then let those who suffered in life at least find peace in death. That was all I wanted. God dang boy. <laughs> On that day, a hole opened up, up in my heart. For how long I stood on that wall, I didn't know. I simply stared into the bottom of the fire, listened to it roar and cackle, crackle. At some point, the slaughter had ended, yet it felt like, felt like it continued still. The blood wouldn't stop flowing. Floating on the ground, it stepped, seeped through the cracks and soaked the earth below. Small seed received it. Breaking through the ground, it grew. Taller, taller and taller still, till it split the very sky above. I watched as it descended, as it transformed the city's hellish red to iridescence. The twelfth calamity, Sare, the Calamity Eater. Unlike the leaven that preceded it, Sare was a sapient ent entity, an intelligent being that eradicated humans with a cold and calculated ferocity. For example, an exhausted and overextended army that had let its guard down after defeating the last of its enemies. An army that had positioned itself in the rings of walls with little to no escape points. One that had set fire to the very defensive fortifications it could have used to seek refuge in. Sarah had chosen now to attack such an army. The battle was over before it even began. After sealing all available escape routes with its cursed fire, it began its reaping. Sarah's flame. All that were consumed by it were reduced to glittering dust, fonts of energy that Sarah feasted on in turn. The slightest burn spelled inevitable death, with the fire itself being in inextinguishable by human hands. There was no known countermeasure. And at the same time, though, Sarah was not invincible. Unlike the other calamities, Sarah was something human humans could fight back against. But it was precisely for that reason that it knew to strike where, when we were weakest. With ruth ruthless efficiency, Sarah proceeded to single out the armor and artillery next, leaving little more than piecemeal small arms to bear against it. Perhaps the most terrifying thing was wh how well it understood humans, though. It had left just one opening, one avenue of retreat, a massive breach in the wall that could be seen from anywhere in the city, so it could funnel a man and kill him. Oh. Humans wish to live, humans wish to survive. Faced with an overwhelmingly powerful opponent, there was one thing people would do upon being offered a path to safety. People attempting to flee were easy to kill. There was no resistance compared to those that had their backs against back to a wall. Knowing that, Sarah had deliberately left an opening, triggering a route rather than a last stand. But needless to say, there were none that, none that escaped alive. I simply watched as everything, everyone, was turned to ash. A calamity that targeted humans with malice and exactitude, exploiting human hope and, and nature to destroy us. One that cannibalized even its fellow calamities in order to grow stronger. From the very moment it had decided to attack, at that time, at that place, we had lost. Our powerlessness, our feebleness, it had been stripped and laid bare to view. 
The sheer futility and meaninglessness. Just like that, our campaign came to an end. Scattered like dust and ash in the wind. Not a single soul had been spared. At the tombstone, at the end of the world. Only I was left. Only I remained. fish in the bowl was happy. To it, the bowl was a world. The fish in the bowl was safe. It did not but eat and swim. I asked of the fish in the bowl, what would it do if the world were to come to an end? Perhaps it would accept and pass on in peace. Perhaps it would resist until its final breath. Or perhaps it would be lost and unable to do anything at all. The fish did not answer. It did not know what it meant for the world to end. Living day to day, it ate and swam. Excuse me. Free of worry, free of thought. Until one day, it realized the water was slowly shrinking. Its world became smaller. The fish, the water, and the bowl was now the world. It became smaller, making the fish afraid. I thought that maybe now the fish could answer my question, but it it did not just do one. But it did not do just one thing. The fish did many things. It became mad. It became sad. Standing in place, slamming the glass. It did so many things, many more things than eat and swim. But regardless of what the fish did, it did not matter. There was no meaning in what it did. But at least for me, it was more interesting to see it like this. There was something sweet about how it struggled so. so. It was then the fish found his voice and cried out, Save me, save me, save me, save me. Hearing the, its voice, I answered, I will save you, I will save you. After all, I wanted to see it do many things, many more things than eat and swim. I took the bowl, held it close within my arms. Chip, crack, shatter. All it took to end a world was the softest squeeze. The fish fell, through the darkness it fell. Until at long last, splash, droplet against water's surface, ripples radiating into the void. It made a pretty bad pattern. The fish rejoiced. It had been saved. It no longer had to fear the waning water. But as it looked around, it seemed confused. Something was wrong. Something was different that it could not describe. With uncertainty in its heart, fish swam forth. Ford, Ford. Swam and swam, swimming until I, it could swim no longer. But no matter how much it pushed forward, doubled back and turned around, nothing greeted it but a yawning abyss. When it realized the one truth it took comfort in was a lie, it showed me something nice. I laughed and told the fish, Welcome to the world. Arch Pontiff, from servant of God to the venerated, from venerated to the bait beatified. Surely the refulgence of the Lord dwells within thee, for miracles beyond counting have been vow woven by thine hand. Today we canonize a saint that does not watch over us from heaven, but guides mankind forth with their feet firmly planted upon the earth. Let her name be heard. Saint Versan. A hero of humanity, a paragon of the people. For the one who led the prototype CD section, because perhaps it was only a matter of course. The Lost Children, that was what our unit was known as now. Due to its near non-existent survival rate, the names and faces of the fallen were never known for long before another took its place. To fight and be forgotten, to fall and fade into obscurity. For the forlorn hope that stood at the forefront, and that was the only fate that awaited us. The march of time, and had brought our, us on campaign after campaign, until at long last no enemies remained 
to march against. With the remnants of humanity united under the banner of the Sylvian Church, our role came to an end, and so it was the only natural to be given a new one. The HPM's headquarters under the Cathedral City. Once again I had returned. Only this time I was heading to an area I had never set foot in before. PID on two personnel requesting to enter central ring. Personal identification, I guess. Biometrics authentication confirmed. PS SAP clearance confirmed. Cross check on pre authorized scheduled traffic confirmed. Lowering airlock bulkhead. No foreign or unaccounted elements detected within close environment vestibule. Releasing multi tier gate lock. Accessing to a central ring quarter. Granted. It bears repeating, but what you're about to see is highly classified SCI. Spectral man with graying hair. According to the briefing I'd be given, he was one of the principal minds behind the HPM's flagship black project. Is this what we will be protecting? As we travel down the corridors, corridor, the walls transition to glass panels. Row after row of pod-like machinery could be seen beyond the glass. Not quite. This is... This is the auxiliary processor server farm. Which is, is also integral to our aims. Your role is security of what is considered to be... Considered the HPM's most valuable asset. The scale of the server... F ah. The scale of the server, for server farm was a staggering. Though we had already walked a fair distance, it showed no sign of ending. Tell me something. As someone who has been on the front lines from the edge of the world and back, I would like to ask you for your frank opinion. As things stand now, do you think humanity has a chance of surviving? I ponder the question posed to me, but it does not take me long to arrive at an answer. No. Against the tenth cal calamity, we are living on borrowed time. The tenth calamity, the claret biomass. A colossal organism that resembled a perpetually expanding sea of flesh, the cleric biomass had already enveloped over 60% of the world's landmass, though slow and susceptible to damage. Even weapons of mass destruction and CD countermeasures had done little to stop its ceaseless advance. Its resilience of regenerative properties was why it was known as known by the appellation Immortal Flesh. Even if we developed a way to stop the Clarit biomass, we have no way to answer the continuing convergence of the Akiran Sea. That's right. The world will end without fail, that much is to be certain. Nothing short of a miracle on the level of God can save humanity. At long last, we arrive at the final gate. But if God will not hear our prayers, then we have no choice but to take his work on into our own hands. The overseer places its palm on the gate. This is the answer that we've arrived at. With a hissing sound, it unlocks and parts. The creation of the new world. Project New Sakotrain. So The moment I laid eyes on her, I knew. Perhaps it had been a vision or a dream, but there could be no doubt. She was the one that held me so many years ago. The one who pulled me back from the darkness of depths. Subject 6L 25861. An artificial human, genetically engineered to be optimized conduit of CD, that has been further blessed by a series of astronomical improbable mutations. In order to push CD to its absolute limits, her brain was fused with the HPM's quantum supercomputer, resulting in a CD savant living processor capable of creating the world of new Sakotrine. Sakotrine. Creation of a new world. It was nothing short of infringing on the domain of God. It had been shown that hope remained still, a path to tomorrow existed. And yet the sight before me did not inspire any sense of deliverance. Is she suffering? 
I was well aware of how meaningless of a question that it was. But regardless, it was not something I could leave unasked. No. Project knew Soko Train's specifications entailed the suppression of her consciousness. Her mind has been subsumed in the process. I see. Then it's the same for those in the auxiliary processor server farm. For a moment, my statement seemed to leave him at a loss. That's right. It's the same. But he quickly recovers. It's not my place to determine whether or not what we're doing is right or wrong. But, perhaps, it's different for a living saint such as yourself. With a quiet murmur, the overseer, overseer turns back and returns to the gate lock. You've been given at will access, privilege, and full execute authority in matters pertaining to 6L25861 security. You're free to do as you please. With those final words, he exists, exits the room, leaving just me and her. I couldn't deny how shaken I was. For all those years, I had seen her face when my, I shut my eyes at night. I had longed for the comfort and warmth I felt in her hands. And yet to finally see her again in such a state, it made triple, tremors ripple through my entire being. Somewhere inside me, a piece of me was howling out, roaring, raging against the uh, fastest smile, the simile I wore. I thought I had changed. I thought I had become someone who could carry out their role unhesitantly. But in the end, I was still nothing more than a powerless child wandering lost in the dark. The darkness, the, those de that darkness, those depths. Perhaps I had never truly awoken up from that dream. Once more I was here. Knowing that she was here in this place, rest did not visit me. Once more, I placed my hand on the glass. Nothing but a thin sheet separated us, but the distance felt hopelessly vast. I couldn't reach out to her. I couldn't close the distance. Just what was it that separated us? It would have taken nothing at all to crush the glass between us and her, between us and free her. But I couldn't do that. Something did not allow me to. Just what was it that bound me so? How long have you been here? Apparently, when I first met her, she had been already been integrated, long been integrated into the HPM's mainframe. It was a project that preceded even the emergence of the calamities. Somehow, she had reached out for out for me when I needed someone the most, and yet. I could not do the same for her. All I could do was place my hand against the glass. That was the path I had chosen, the type of person I had become. A guardian of humanity, a protector of its future. That was the role I had taken upon myself. The weight I bore was nothing compared to what she carried. It was nothing and yet, even that small weight that couldn't be compared felt like it was crushing me. Time marched on, heedless of the discord within me. With the chlorine biomass drawing even closer, the pressure to complete new Project Socotry mounted. New additions were made to the auxiliary processor server farm on a daily ba near daily basis. At first, only 00-05 series artificial humans created for the express purpose of relegation to the server farm were used. But under the duress of time, the HPM expanded the scope of candidates, human experimentation test subjects, civilians that demonstrated CD aptitude, aptitude. Anyone in the HPM could use. Anyone the HPM could use were put to an in an induced comatose state, placed in paralytic stasis, and rendered into living processors. How far was it acceptable to go for the sake of mankind's survival? Perhaps it was cold inhuman even, but none of that registered with me. All that accompanied my thoughts was what lay behind the glass. When would it come to an end? When would she be freed? I couldn't calm myself. Torn between something inside me that screamed to act and something else that shackled me, I simply stood in place. It tormented me, watching her, but at the same time, 
not coming to this place wasn't something I could do. Even if it was a hollow, meaningless act, coming to this place, I would put my hand on the glass. There's nothing else to do, so long as I walked this path. So long as I remained the person that I was, there was nothing else I could do. If I were to call out to you, would you save me? Even though you are the one lost in the night, even though you are the one denied respite, would, won't you forsake your salvation for mine, my dear little fish in the bowl? Artificial life, the creation of human beings through human hands, independent of the uni union between man and woman. In the age of alchemy, it took the form of incomplete humanoids called homunculus. However, even in the era of information, artificial humans fell short of people be born of sperm, sperm and egg. Excuse me. Imperfect inferior. There was always something missing. No matter how much we tried, we could not create a being that stood on equal grounds with us. That's why it shouldn't have been possible. It shouldn't have been possible to create something that surpassed mankind. Subject 6L25861 From the moment she opened her eyes, the course of human history changed. It was as if a merc we had been struggling futilely... Fut I don't know how to pronounce that. Futilely... Futilely... Utilely, though had cleared, replaced with a brightly glowing path. Perhaps that was what made me most anxious. We simply had to walk forward, and we would be saved. Utility. The XXXXX actualization assessment, and a series of experiments designed to gauge a broad potential of 6L25861CD. That was the moment we realized something that just transcended humanity walked among, a, among us. The only thing we knew was that something difficult to destroy had been placed in a close chamber with her, that she had been given simple instructions. Destroy XXXXX to the best of your abilities. The end result defied comprehension. Not only has she obliterated XXXXX, leaving no trace behind, she had erased all records and memories of it from the world. Something that had simply had been there simply ceased to be. Its specs, production history, log logistics, no matter how far we scoured back, the footprints led to an undefined void. It became apparent that the power she wielded was beyond our ability to conceive. CD aptitude, intelligence, psychometrics, moral cognition. 6L25861's parameters were seamless, exceeding even our wildest imaginings. As if she knew the answer we wished to hear, and the results we wished to see. She was the perfect candidate for Project New Socotrin, which had only remained a hypothetical until her genesis. I remember the conference we held. Hours upon hours of chaotic debate, all revolving around one thing, the decision of whether or not to refuse 6L25861 with the HPM's quantum supercomputer, the ethicality, the uncertainty. There were simply too many variables. That was what I argued. But if I were to be completely honest, I was simply afraid. Afraid of losing a formless something and choosing to proceed on this path. Unable to come to a consensus, it came down to a vote, but it was more of a morality than anything. There was only one vote that opposed the decision. On that day, she was the same as always. There had always been something unnerving about her, a chilling sense that she could see straight through you. While I understood nothing of her, it felt like everything of mine laid bare before her. After all, we did not stand on equal grounds. Just as homunculi were of no compare to humans, she possessed something that we did not. Even as we prepared for her integration into the mainframe, she remained the same as always, silent until asked a question and concise with her answers. 
Her face was always blank and devoid of emotion. I could never tell what she was thinking. As if it was all happening to someone else. As if it didn't concern her. She remained indifferent and detached. It was incredibly frustrating. Have you really nothing to say? Don't you understand what this means for you? I do. Then how can you stay so calm? She didn't answer for me. It was always like this. The more I tried to understand her, the more I realized how impossible it was. The difference between us was simply too vast. What are your thoughts on Project New Sakatrine? There are issues in ethicality and uncertainty. Many variables remain unaccounted for. You... Why would you tell such a blatant lie? Without so much as a pause, she recited my own stance on the matter back at me, almost for ad verbatim. As if the audience and what they wished for, wished to hear, was just another factor, was just another factor to craft her responses around. If one of the other researchers asked you, you would have responded differently. Isn't that right? Once again, she went quiet. Her conditioning and curriculum had prioritized fostering the values of trust and altruism before all else. But that did not mean she was beholden to those boundaries. Please tell me. Why would you go along with this? What do you really want? What are you hiding from us? Questions that had gone unasked until now. Finally, I was giving voice to them. I am not trying to hide anything from you. Lying? What is that supposed to mean? But as I come to expect, she did not reply. Slowly, what had been vaguely disquieting began to take a concrete form. Perhaps I had been in denial, not wanting to believe my misgivings held any weight to them. But I had long passed the point where I could feign ignorance anymore. You know something that we don't, and you're keeping it from us. Isn't that right? Apprehension turned to suspicion. Suspicion turned to conviction. Surely I was onto something. That's what I, that was what I thought. Are you really on humanity's side? Do you have an ulterior motive? Or perhaps... I remember that moment clearly even to this day. Her face, ne which never showed an inkling of emotion, turned down and away from me. And then she spoke the last words she ever said to me. At the end, I hoped at least you would be my ally. But that's right. You don't see me as a human. At that moment, it all fell into place. All the doubts and suspicions I could not describe. The anxiety and unease I could not give shape to. Her words stuck a chord within me, sending shivers to the core of my being. Oh, alarm. Fear. That was what I had been feeling. And the root of it was just as she said. I didn't see her as a fellow human being. That's... no. I... It all made sense now. The sheer simplicity was what shook, shocked me the most. I... I searched for the words to say. Words for the human being before me I had ever never seen. But just what words could I, could I have offered? Be forgiven for the cruel things I said. I had thought it was because she existed beyond the realm of humanity. But when I looked at her th through the lenses of a normal human being, it was painfully clear. She was simply awkward. Having been born in a f this facility, knowing nothing but cold clinical studies, it was wrong to say she was emotionless. She simply had never been equipped with the experiences needed to express herself. It wasn't as if... She <laughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. It wasn't as if she had been treated poorly. Her... Every need had always been promptly and comfortably met, but at the same time, it was thoroughly divorced from what could be considered a normal upbringing. Knowing neither love nor warmth, hatred nor neglect, her entire world was contained within the confines of these white walls. Surrounded by people who saw her as different from them, yet who demanded that she bear the weight of humanity's future. I had never realized just how isolated she was. Even though I had been there at her side since her gestation, how could I have been so blind? There is something wrong with me. I am missing something. I am incomplete. 
I wish to find it, to find to find the pieces I am missing. But there is no, not enough time for me to do that. There is not enough time. I will play my role and you will play yours. There is no meaning beyond that. And for that reason, our paths will never cross. This concludes the summary. Gosh, this concludes the summary of your integration into the HPM's mainframe. Do you have any other questions? Ah, oh, gosh, give me a second. One twenty-six. Wordlessly, she shook her head. The time had come. The time had come, and yet, why did it feel like nothing more than a distant dream? As stated, your consciousness will be subsumed in your fusion with the quantum supercomputer. We see this as a positive corollary, as it will prevent you from experiencing any discomfort or distress during your stasis. Excuse me. That was not the full truth. The suppression of her consciousness was ideal, as it ensured the untold power of Project New Socotrin remained under control, under our control. Her will was seen as nothing more than a risk factor, and there was no doubt she was aware of that. But despite that, she simply nodded. Then we will begin. Be, we will be beginning shortly. Is there anything you would like to say before we commence? I remember at that moment she turned to me. Ever so slightly, she turned and our eyes met. Within that gaze, that solitary figure, I felt just a fraction of the weight she carried. And yet, that fraction that I couldn't even begin to encompass. It crushed me, grinding me down to the core. Maybe if I had realized sooner, maybe if I had been stronger, I could have reached out, I could have said something. But at that place, at that time, I found myself unable to do anything at all. I couldn't face her. Unable to meet her gaze, I hung my head as if I was searching for words to pick off the ground. No, a single syllable. It drove into my heart like a wedge of ice. Why? Why had I never given her perspective a second thought? All this time she had suffered in silence, while I did nothing, not even noticing. Just like that, she went to sleep, switching from a person to a thing. The human being before me lost something, and perhaps I as well, lost something I could never get back. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. General quarters, general quarters, all hands, man your battle stations, the route of travel, follow contingency plan, C-12. Set material condition Zulu throughout all rings. This is not a drill. Reason for general quarters, hot style contact with Sayer. This too was something that was fated to come to pass. Actual, this is Grandfell 3-8. We are Redcon 1, over... Grenfell 38, this is actual. Rendezvous at second ring junction intercept site over. Roger, we are Oscar Mike to the. Uh, what is that again? Aerial Operations? Out? Is that what it is? AO? I think. Aerial Operations. As I proceed to the pre designated post for the lost children in the event of an attack by Sayer, I listen in on the staff's reports trickling in. Sarah had already bre breached the peripheral rings and had engaged the cathedral city, city garrison. In the end, it chose a frontal assault. Such an attack on the cathedral city was nothing short of suicidal. But despite that, Sarah continued to push through ring after ring, flashing head force against the city's defenses. Why would it do such a thing? It was futile. Even if Sarah managed to defeat the city's garrison and the lost children, the HPM had one final card to play. The details had not been disclosed to me, but it was the HPM's latest and final project. An anti-calamity weapons program entitled Project Benair. Of course the details were of no import. Import. Because Sayer was going to die here and now. At long last, the elevator arrives at the chosen battlefield. As I step into a room, a thunderous cra crash resounds through the air. Shattered, spent, and drenched in its own blood. Already, it could be said Sarah was on the death door. While it had managed to overpower the garrison, it had sustained heavy damage in the process. Just to reach here, it had pushed itself well past its limits. X, 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 X. 
There is no sign of the prudent and calculating entity that had leveled into the sunken capital. Nothing but a wounded beast slashing out in reckless desperation could be seen. Partition C2 through F2 deploying. However, flames did not reach us. Modular bulb heads that could be strategically deployed to intercept the ever-burning flames. Floor, ground, and ceiling. Composites. Designed to cycle out effective material to burn in remote locations. Partitions re retracting. By the time the bulkheads disappear, we had already left its confines behind. Excuse me. Countdown initiated. Six. Six seconds. Five. That was the window we had to inflict as much damage as possible. Four. The minimal amount of time it took Sayer to re-employ its flames. Three. The duration determined by the analysis of all footage and records that existed of Sayer. Two. The crystallization of humans' knowledge and wisdom. One. Forge into a blade to strike at our enemies. Zero. Once again, Sarah unleashes prismatic flames. Partition B4 through D6 deploying. Once again, it failed to reach its mark. Partition retracting. Ah, uh, X, 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 X. But before we can close in, Sarah unfurls its wings and takes flight, leaving clouds of crackling haze in its waist. The third calamity. Fulminair Steam. One of the first to be consumed by the Calamity Eater. Its hazardous and obscuring properties made it a powerful defensive tool. But of course its usage by Sayer was also well documented in the HPM's archives. Galth C-12.3 Wind Tunnel Deploying NBE 11.25 Azimuth Degrees PTFE Vents Disengaging the roaring winds disperses the charged steam and pins Sayer's airborne figure against the far wall. With the wind at our back, we bear down on Sayer once more. In any other place, Sayer's innate ability to fly would have been a strategic boom. But here, our ability to modulate and control the flow of air made it a liability. This was the difference between Sayer and us humans. No matter how cunning and powerful Sayer was, it only had itself to rely on. The room was designed by humanity's first engineer, finest engineers and strategists to become Sarah's grave. Everything Sarah was capable of had been meticulously accounted for. XXXXXXX. Perhaps it realized how shallow its options were. With little other recourse, Sarah met us head on with claws and fangs. As signal to disengage, Sarah cleaves into our ranks with uncanny speed. The ninth calamity, or as Razian Divergence. In a physical battle where flight had been denied it as an option, our maneuverability far surpassed Sayer. However, utilizing Razian Divergence to manipulate time made it possible for even a massive beast like Sayer to match us in mobility. Our countermeasure was simple. Outlast the Onslaught. Accelerating beyond its normal bounds placed enormous strain on his body. Sayer was already injured and exhausted as well. Withdrawing behind our Pavasair Pavis designations, we shift our focus to evasion and conduct a metered retreat. But no matter how much we withdrew, Sayer pursued us relentlessly. Partitions F8 through H7 deploying. Growling us into a corner, Sayer pierces us down, pins us down with its flames. Partitions retracting. However, when we make to break out, we find ourselves face to face with a certain of a curtain of Fulminar Stream. Gal C12.3 Wind Tunnel Deploying SSW South Southwest 202.5 Azimuth Degrees ETFE Vents Disengaging. The moments the wind shift, Sarah soars into the air. In order to prevent the steam from blowing into us, the angles we would direct it, we could direct the wind was limited. Sarah was using that to its advantage. Its objective, the central ring intricate. After all, there was no need for it to fight us if it could simply circumvent us. However, this too was something we had planned for. Partition H8 deploying. After all, those attempting to flee were easy to kill. 
wings to wells. A star fallen from the sky chain to the earth. With a deafening crash, Sarah plummets to the ground. X, 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 X. More than just his physical wings, I severed the very concept of flight from Sarah's being. Never again would it blot out the sky. Painted in blood, Sarah turns back to us and roars as we rush forward. From now on, there would be no flame. Neither us, neither was willing to back down. Neither was willing to coexist. We stood at polar opposites. One an enemy of humanity, the other its defenders. There was no compromise to be made. And so we would fight until only one of us remained. Blood to match the own we had spilt. Each of us standing our ground, we carve into each other without end. But it was plain to see that our casualties were mounting. Even though Sarah had long exceeded the duration it was projected to be able to sustain a raising and divergence, it showed no signs of stopping. Even though we gouged deep into his bodies countless times, countless times it refused to fall. Before long, I was the only one that remained. The rest had been incapacitated or killed. Ventile 29, Tambor 74. But even then, I was not alone. There were those that marched at my side still. Sanket 68, Hallis 79. I had been there when every and each one of them fell. As long as I remained standing, it was within my power to remember them, carry their memories on, on in this endless march. Heracle 43, Moire 3 Cetera. Loden 7-5. The difference between us and Ser was that we knew loss and defeat. Because we were weak. Because we were, could fail and leave behind those that could fight another day. It was for that reason that we could grow strong. But for Ser, dying was the end of the line. With its wings shorn and its legs crushed, no tomorrow existed for it. Perhaps Sarah had come to the re that realization as well. It raked his claws against the ground, tearing a rift in space. The sixth calamity, and a, and a sigil rift. Though rare, there were accounts of Sarah using the sixth calamity to escape after being cornered. But rather than flee, Sarah stands his ground. His body begins to shimmer as it absorbs the energy that spills out from the Sea of Akera. Warning, energy level spiking. Pattern indicate, indicative of explosive reaction. Suicide attack. For a moment, hesitation fills me. Why? Sarah's actions until now couldn't be described as anything but reckless, desperate even. What was this goal that it was even willing to sacrifice even its life? No, none of that mattered. There was no denying Sarah was an enemy of humanity, and for that reason, it would fall here. XXXX. His cries were not heard. Sarah's head tumbles from his neck, falling into the rift below. His body crumbles and follows shortly after. Elimination of HVT C12 confirmed. Emergency medevac en route. Aperture, aperture between Ocaran Sea and Corporeal Plane due to six calamity Anis gel rift confirmed. Initializing preparation to seal second ring junction intercept site. The battle was over. Though we had sustained the heavy casualties in the process as long last, we had triumphed over one of many, humanity's greatest threats. It should have been cause for celebration, and yet, I felt nothing. There was nothing but a dull sense of emptiness, a hollow weight within my chest. After completing our casualty assessment and mission debriefing, I set off on a at a hurry pace. I wanted to see her as soon as possible. An uneasiness I could not assuage had settled in the depths of my stomach. If I could just see her once more, but... When I enter, I find her nowhere to be found. Where? Where did she go? St. Fair's son. An orderly in the room addresses me, bowing deeply. Congratulations on your victory against Sarah. I was told to pass on to you that new Project Sosquatrine had been seen, has been seen to its completion. 
6L25861's role has come to an end, her role has ended, then what does the HPM intend to do with her? Preparations are currently being made for S6L25861's vivisection and autopsy. Uh-oh. It seems that since 6L25861's operational lifespan is near its end, they wish to glean as much insight as possible into the nature of uni unique mutations. We had refrained from invasive procedures to shed light on it due to how instrumental 6L25861 was to Project New Socotrine. But now that it's been completed, the orderly's words taper off. I have passed on what I've been ordered to. Then if you would excuse me. Hmm. Saint Verson, congratulations on your victory over the Calamity Eater. Though I would likely, uh, I would like to have you properly acknowledged for your achievements. That is not why you are here, is it? Revoke the vivisection order on her. Now. You come before me wearing hypocrisy as conviction. We walk a stairway steeped in the blood of countless, yet another drop is what... Would have you turn your blade against us? I have not come here to listen to your artifice. She will be released, regardless of whether or not you want to comply. The only question is whether or not you become another drop in the tide. There is no one that can match your strength, my saint. It would be trivial, trivial for you to impose your will as you wished. It, it the strong that is permitted to shape the world as they desire after all. But if you believe that it, it is only that we trespass into the realm of sacrilege, you are mistaken. No, the one sin for which we will never know absolution. It's the very act of creating her. What we have done is blasphemous, the pinnacle of heresy. We have created God within our own hands in order to bear the weight of the loss of tomorrow. But while it may be a front unlike any other to our Father in Heaven, I have no intention of recanting. The Arch Pontiff spoke unba uh, unabashedly of what was known, but never voiced here. 6L25861 has exceeded her projected operational lifespan. She will die at any moment now. But while her role may be finished, humanity's struggle will not end with her with our flight from Socotrine. New Socotrine is an isolated pocket in the Arcaran Sea in which many, any number of trials may await, such as the, as the end of the world once more. You would do it all again as many times as necessary. Should it come to it that humanity needs to create God once more, this is for that sake. Or would you deny our heritors the spider strand we clung in order we clung to in order to survive. The reason was never unclear. It will not happen again. Happen regardless. You are unswayed, I see. But there is one thing you are mistaken on. Our understanding of 6L25861 is limited. As such, we are free to craft any narrative our heart desires. You and the Overseer have chosen to see her as a blameless martyr, chosen by humanity to be its sacrifice. But if there is one being whose power exceeds even your own, it is 6L25861 herself. We walk a path shaped in, our wa in ways beyond our comprehension. It is folly to think any agency of hers has been for forfeited in favor of obedience to smaller minds. She was born in this facility, conditioned to fulfill her role at any cost, to say nothing of the suppression of her consciousness. Such chains could only shackle a human. She is anything but. You would deny even her humanity then. It is our conceited and self-absorbed ego that should seize her as one of our own, as a sacrifice for our sake alone. It was clear that neither side would yield. The consensus could not be met, and so there was only one thing to be done. I will hear any... I will hear of any last words now. Oh, very well. Then a confession from a fake pope to a fake saint. With a dry laugh, the arch pontiff steps down from the throne. <laughs> I'm certain this was before your time, but... 
My predecessor was a fool. Believing that the converged to be the will of God, he urged the faithful to embrace the end. I lo remember looking d upon his rhetoric with indignation. That was when I heard it, whispers within my heart. Mankind was not meant to perish here. That was what the voice told me. In other words, the voice of God, which only prophets and supreme leaders of the church were said to be proven to. I needn't tell you what happened next. You were on the very front lines, after all. I stopped at nothing. Even if it meant destroying humanity, I would save it. It did not matter how much blood I spilt. I devoted my life to that singular goal, uncaring for the sins I accrued. Finally, at the end of the like why, I don't know what that, leaky way, we opened up the door to humanity's future, which had laid shut for so long. And yet, why is it that I feel nothing at all? The arch pontiff smiles as if it were all, as if it were all farce comedy. The voice that guided me is no more. In the silence that followed, I made my decision. I will not be going to New Sakatrine, nor do I want anything of paradise. Silently, he sinks to his knees. Do not forget the indignation that burns within you. It is that resolve that permits you to take on this mantle. I do not believe God resides only with prophets and popes. Rather, a piece of his, his lies within each and every one of us. Bowing his head, he signs the cross for the final time. Listen to the whispers of your heart, my dear saint. May the world that awaits you be far removed from our last soccer train. On the edge of the, a new dawn, I bore witness to his final words. Then, Holy Father, I will be taking your head now. Got him. Da da da. He lay before me, bedridden on the eve of the final act. The one that Project New Soccer Team could be the, called the brainchild of. Can you hear my voice? There was nothing extraordinary about what ailed him. Exhaustion. Overexertion. Fatigue that had accumulated into the years. The vivisection order has been rescinded. The church is no more. For a split second, something seemed to stir within him. He turns to me. There's little time. You must tell me. Is there a way to restore her consciousness? With unprecedented vigor, he rips his ventilator from his airway. The Iseri Protocol. With shaking hands, he produces a black key card. Sela, Sela, Soth Este, Estate. John 10-9, John 10-5. A passcode? He draws in a wheezing breath. <sighs> it is all there. The secrets I never spoke of. Our sin runs deeper than we ever imagined. He clutches at my hand with white knuckles. Please, please. Desperately drawing breath into his lungs. <sighs> Choking on what he could not leave unvoiced, he spoke. Please be by her side. Do what I could not. Ah! <laughs> That's his death noise. Okay. I am the gate. Whoever enters me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. John 10, 9. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him. Because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. John 10, 5. I made it! Oh, I made it. I'm the best. God dang it. Yes. Oh, they thought they had me. I have come to realize something. Bearing the weight of the truth in my final years. Lies. Lies save people. They let people see a dream. A dream unconstrained by its absurdity of reality. However, a lie cannot be made alone. For a lie is a world, and a minimal, and the minimum it takes to create a world is two. There is one who must know the truth, and for that reason, they cannot join the blissful ignorant. If you are reading this, that is the role I ask you to take upon yourself. The same role I have taken upon. Project Benair. That was where it all began. An anti-calamity -calam bioweapon designed program designed as a contingency should project new soccer train fail to be completed ahead of Claret Biomaster's advance. In the incubation of Project Benair's first iteration, Subject O.N. Blanc remains at flux. It is unknown if O.N.'s conception can be successfully realized. 
However, Project Benair's second iteration, formed by splintering off a fragment of off ON, successfully gestated approximately three years ago. Both iterations are pre-mutations of 6L25861's genetic templ template that assimilates recumbent DNA harvested from calamity samples, such as tissues, cultures from Sayer and the Claret biomass. In that case, you could say they are monsters, life forms designed to destroy what even weapons of mass destruction and conventional CD cannot. However, I ask you that I ask you not to make the same mistake I once did. Subject 1 B. Schwartz. Through, though that is his destination, he is but a young boy that only recently opened his eyes to the world. I promised myself to never let these children endure what 6L did. For that reason, I have taken to calling 1B Bressel and acting as a father figure to the best of my ability. Owen as well. Though she had yet to awaken for the first time, I beseech whoever's reading this. Please let the first word she hear she hears be my name. Be her name, Noletta. Please give them the life that 6L never knew. I'm gonna have to rewatch my first video to know who leads like I don't remember Noletta. It sounds familiar, but I don't remember it. I don't remember some of these names. But though I say that, I it cannot be denied they are truly they truly are different. It is through Project Benair that we have discovered an entirely new subset of CD, Pathos Pattern Type CD. The Logos Pattern Type CD we are familiar with utilizes theory and expertise to mold that fabric of reality into one's internalized vision of the world. For example, the end output of Logos Type CD that creates fire, that creates fires, fire operates within the law of thermodynamics and its efficacy is dictated by the user's proficiency on the topic. While the process is miraculous, the end result is not. Pathos type CD subverts in this entirely, possessing the capacity to actualize phenomena that defies the rules of the world and limits of human intellect. This can be observed through Bressel's unique CD pattern, Lear Inc., as we have taken to calling it takes the semblance of a deep black fluid. However, every instance of attempting to analyze its properties has resulted in wildly varying parameters. At times, is no letter the one at the start of Fall Streak before like all the stuff happens? At times, it measures as denser than liquid mercury. Other times, it measures lighter than liquid hydrogen. Sometimes it resembles, resembles an inert solid, and sometimes it shifts between Newtonian, non-Newtonian, and superfluid states of matter. But most perplexing, Lear ink has been observed to flow through other matter, negate gravity, and even ignore the conservation of energy at inconsistent intervals. Due to its sporadic and volatile nature, nature the cornerstone of pathos type CD eludes us. Excuse me. But in my mind's eye, I had already begun to see the eerie slim similarity with the phenomena conjured by the Twelve Calamities. Perhaps that was the last chance I had at turning back. It gnawed at me until I could not sleep at night. Something like dread hanging over every waking moment. I told myself it, it was given it was to give me peace of mind. To confirm my fears were unfounded. Utilizing our newfound discoveries on Pathos Type CD, I proceeded to conduct several tests on 6L. That was when I unearthed it, the truth that haunts me to this day. 6L's consciousness had n never fully been subdued. Though the vector of Pathos Type CD, a fragment of her mind, had remained intact. Unbeknownst to us, she had been trapped in a tenuous state of existence. Unable to move, perceive, or communicate, even as her brain was continuously exhausted in order to perform new Socrates' computations. The Twelve Calamities are nothing other than her subconscious wish to be freed from, to be freed given form, distortions, born from her fractured mental state. The wanton destruction that they visit upon last Socrates is driven by their sole impetus to save, that, save the one that called them into existence. Of course we're the ones that did it to ourselves. Oh, freaking course. 
After all, we were the ones that consign consigned her to this hell. Query received. Compiling request data from private encrypted channel. The first calamity, prism corrosion, an ab aberrant psychosomatic disease that crystallizes the tissue of those that it afflicts irreversibly until they are rendered incapable of moving and perish from organ failure. Hypo hypothesized, well, I don't know why I struggled, to be a manifestation of the severance of 6L's 25861's control from her body and physical entrapment. The second calamity, phlogistic rain. Searing blue-green liquid that rains down from the sky accompanied by a thrum likened to the overheating machinery, hypothesized to be a manifestation of the nanofluid coolant that versus HPM's quantum computers in order to regulate the immense heat they generate. The third calamity, fulminar steam, an anomalous gas that generates persistent high wattage electrical discharges, hypothesized to be manifestation of the catatombo turbine system that supplies the immense amount of power expended by the HPM's mainframe. The fourth calamity, hyperox hyperoxian dust, pale blue particulate matter that causes impaired breathing, lug hemorrhaging, and asphyxiation when inhaled, hypothesized to be manifestation of the oxygenated, oxygenated persistent airflow supplied to 6L25861 as part of her advanced life support apparatus. The fifth calamity, Prisarch hallucination, an illness of the mind that causes those it afflicts to see illusions of faceless ghosts. As the symptoms progress, Stricken begin to see the living as featureless specters as well as and eventually even their own reflections as one. Hypothesized to be a manifestation of 6L25861's depersonalization as well as the obf obfuscation and disassociation of her identity re resulting from being linked with countless minds from the HPM's auxiliary processor server farm. The Sixth Calamity, and a Shelf Rift, a dimensional anomaly, anomaly that tears fissures in space-time fabric, hypothesized to be a manifestation of the schismatic twilight between the corporeal plane and Ocarian C, that 6L25861's fragment, fragmented conscious resides within. The seventh calamity, Peller Scar, an abnormal metal that inflicts persisting chronic wounds, even minor lacerations, and punctures result in blood loss that cannot be staunched, hypothesized to be a manifestation of the surgical implants embedded in 6L25861's nervous system. Central nervous system. The eighth calamity, Logos Worm, a parasitic entity that burrows into the brain of those it affects. It drives its host to insanity and self mutilation through sensory overload and insomnia, hypothesized to be a manifestation of 6L25861's mental duress from being fused with the HPM's quantum supercomputer and having her mind continuously exhausted. The ninth calamity, Erasian Divergence. Localized pockets of time that deviate and progress at different rates from the surrounding area, Hypo hypothesized to be a manifestation of 6L25861's dissolving sense of time due to the absence of any relative point of reference. The tenth calamity, Claret biomass, a colossal sentient organism that resembles a perpetual expanding sea of flesh. The Claret biomass absorbs and incorporates all matter. It envelops into its own form, whether it be organic or inorganic. Its resilience and regenerative properties have given it the appellation immortal flesh, hypothesized to be a manifestation of the medical medical procedures and protocol carried out to forcibly extend 6L25861's life as long as possible. The eleventh calamity, postulated to be a calamity that alters information and states of being. The existence of the length is an extra extrapolation, extrapolation indicated at by the presence of the twelfth calamity. Records and memories of it that may have once existed are absent from documented, documented, and recollect, re recollected human history. Jesus. <sighs> twelfth calamity. Sarah's flame, a sapient calamity characterized by the iridescent flames it breathes. 
which co curse living organisms with deviant burns that progressively spread, causing the body to wilt in turn. Victims consumed fully by the deviant burn dissolve into dust, coalescing into condensed fronts or energy known as Estus Vitae. It is through feasting on reaped Estus Vitae that Ser nourishes itself and grows stronger. Unlike other calamities which wreak destruction one timely and indiscriminately, Sayer targets humans with extreme intent to exterminate. It's merciless consumption of even other calamities in order to utilize their corresponding effects has earned its appellation calamity eater. Amputation and debridement of tissue affected by the deviation burn has proven to be ineffective at treating the ailment. ailment. The soul has known means of curing the curse imparted by Sarah's flame has only recently been pioneered by the HPM. Treatment entails application of SS Vitae from deceased victims to cases that have yet to severely progress. The deviance burns spread can be re proactively accelerated through exposure to high temperatures, allowing for the rapid acquisition of SS Vitae. This is like the whole end of the first game. This Sarah's flame it's talking about, that's like a really big part of the end of the first one. The model of treatment relies heavily on implementing a structured system of triage, but effectively has its case fatality rate of what would otherwise be 100%. It is not known what facet or aspect of Sarah is a manifestation of, but its base motivations appear to align with that of other calamities, as evidenced by its repeated assaults against cathedral cities near impregnable defenses. Oh, I made it. Jesus. Where did we go wrong? When did we lose our way? I no longer know. Perhaps we had grown numb and become unseen to how we have erred. I am lost, unable to confide to the truth to anyone. And yet, there's one silver strand. There is one silver, one strand of hope that I cling to still. The possibility that our consciousness can be recovered. The Esseri Protocol. It is my final work, developed independently from the HPM's pipeline. An experimental procedure designed to restore 6L's consciousness using the fragment of it that remains. I do not know if she can truly be awakened. Her life already tri- Peter's on the precipice, having held on for so long. But, if by some chance, some miracle, you are reading this and she breathes still, Please bring her back from the darkness. If only for a moment, let her see the light once more. Well, no, in this game, this isn't going to work out, obviously. It never does. Vital Stable. Rialta Conceptus. Stability Index. Within operational bounds. Confirming presence of localized schismatic twilight. Confirmed. Initializing ISERI protocol. Estimated time to completion. 2 hours, 9 minutes, 49 seconds. No longer did a sheet of glass separate us. She was right before me now. Reaching out, I take her hand in mine. Her touch was heartbreakingly frail. As if at any moment it could simply fade away. No. Though faint, she was still alive. Her story did not have to end here. Like this. The blue sky. Sky spoken of in stories. I wanted to show her it, the blue sky of the world she gave to us. Let us look upon it together. Something squeezed within my chest. The wish I had never given form to until now. It rung through the air like clear glass bells. It was close, so close now. So close it felt like the world was holding its breath. Actual, this is Granfell 38. We have a status report over. Go ahead. The Clara biomass had, has made contact with the Cathedral City's per, peripheral rings. Your presence is being requested at the bridge. Understood. Inbound now. But though I said that, I didn't want to leave her side. If I let her go, let go of her here, if I turned away now, would she still be here when I returned? I was afraid. Afraid of losing the fragile warmth at my fingertips. But this was a duty I could not eschew. It was now my goal to, role to guide humanity to its final bastion. I'll be back. But there was no strength in my words. I... I couldn't hold it in anymore. 
and I waited so long to be reunited with her, yet to part at a time like this. Please. Sinking to my knees, I pressed her hand against my cheek. Please wait for me. Ah. Passenger bays sealed and proofed. Supplies, depots, hydroponics, security and stasis, turbinous reactor status one isn't one normal. Normal. UL refugee convoy. A detachment of vessels built directly into the HPM's framework designed to ferry the last remnants of humanity to New Socatrine. It was equipped with everything needed to sustain life in the new world. Update from internal observation post. The Claret biomass has penetrated through the third ring and is rapidly approaching the, encroaching the, on the second ring. The rate of expansion is accelerating beyond established thresholds. What's our status on departure? All critical preparations to embark have been completed. Ancillary checklist is still pending diagnostic review. <coughs> We're leaving now. Initiate the jump sequence. Roger. Roger that. Commander in Chief Verisome, the second ring is he most heavily, the most heavily fortified ring in the facility. It should serve as a f sufficient stopgap to clear the ancillary checklist. And the more we of it we leave unattended, the lower the success rate of the jump. We're going to take that risk. Claret biomass is exhibiting abnormal be behavior from what we have on record. It is the bigger threat. Understood, foreign officer. Relaying departure command to subordinate vessels. All copy and Wilco. Transforming from ground to internal power. Activating auto launch sequencer T31 seconds. Initializing dimensional inversion module. Conceptual acres coordinates established. A palpable tension takes hold of the room. Confirming intersection of complex space and the corporeal plane. Instantiating temporal cor corridor with the Sea of Akira. Everything hinged on this moment. Localizing inversion to the fifth image imaginary axis. T5. Executing. Executing. T0. A familiar sense of vertigo assaults me, like floating through the air while being crushed against the ground. Deafened by darkness, blinded by silence, we went, leaving behind the place we called home in search of a new tomorrow. Greetings are in. Successful entry in the Sea of Care confirmed. Systems and hull integrity are green across the board. The room released the breath it had been holding. Did the other vessels make it? Affirmative. All sub subordinate vessels have reported successful egress without complication. Transit to new soccer train underway. ETA is difficult to pinpoint due to the nature of transversal, but it should take no longer than... Ah... Report, what was that? Something's hit our hole. I, it's, it's the Claret Biomass. How did it get into the Sea of Akira? I'm tracking Anna's gel rift RC signatures. Sayer. My mind flashes back to the rift it had torn in the second ring junction intercept site. Had it planned this all along? We've lost contact with vessels three and four. Our hole's been breached. It's racing to the core. Adjutant General, Ad, or Adjutant Admiral, take command of the bridge. Yes, ma'am. Tearing through the hatch, I hurtle down the hall. My feet pound against the ground amidst the creaking groan of the ship. In the distance, I could hear a low rumble as the clarity biomass flooded through the cell, swallowing all in its wake. I had to get there before it did. Please, let me make it in time. I'm so close now. Just one more turn. One more turn and I'd be there. At her side once more, but before I can reach it, the air before me explodes. A wall of flesh, rabid and writhing. It filled the corridor that had been unoccupied mere moments ago, blocking my path forward. Move. Rage. Fear at losing something dear, dear something precious to me. It bubbled up inside me, sparking and spinning fire through my flame. Get out of my way! A red haze clouds my mind as I lash out in a blind flurry. Fury. My blade meets the smart, slicing clean through the cordon of flesh. It parts and pills, spewing blood and viscera. 
but its volume only seems to multiply in response. The wall of flesh surges and spits out countless tendrils erupt from it. There were too many of, to evade and or block. I let them crash against me, heedless, heedless of the wounds that I occurred. I needed to move forward. Slash after slash, thrust after thrust, I plunged my blade into the skirming flesh again and again. Its tendrils piercing gouged me in turn. They bludgeoned and battered me. As if to drown me in the very itcher I split, spilt. The ship judders as I cleave into its side in my fury. But I didn't care. I need to move forward. Ugh. <sighs> My vision begins to swim as dull aches begin to build in my skull. But, God, mental contamination from exposure to the Sea of Akira. It threatens to steal my consciousness away from me. But biting my lip, I claw into wait wakeful distance. Gash, gouge, tear, thrash. Pouring everything into my blade, I resist. I struggle with all my might, but it was no use. Why? Why? Even though I was so close, I couldn't advance. Every step I took forward pushed me back too. Every tindle I cut down, duplicating anew. Was it this as far as I went? Was this how it all ended? No. Not here. Not like this. Stone to sand. Words imbued with the power to bring down any obstacle. A castle on the shore, worn down by waves. Extending my hand, I invoke those words. A right hand from behind me, overlaying mine. It clenches down in concern to my own. With a deafening crash, a deluge of red floods the corridor as the fle as flesh before me crushes and compresses. Step aside. Splitting, slicing, severing with my blade. Crushing, clenching, cratering with my hand. Refusing to fall, refusing to yield, I went forth. Forward, forward. Pushing back against the tide, I advance. One step, two, forward. Forward. Oh! <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Shit, I know this is supposed to be a serious moment, but goddamn. <laughs> From the bottom of the dark sea was it born. Led and lost and lonely. The only thing I can remember was the warmth of its mother. From the bottom of the cold sea it cried out, Mother, Mother. But its voice never reached her. At the end of the dark sea was a faint light. Above the waves, far from reach. I, it wished for that light. Longed for it. However, the only thing it had was itself. There was nothing else. And for that reason, it had to grow. In order to reach that faint light, in order to reach its mother. It consumed everything in its path. Eating, gorging, devouring. It built a tower of its own flesh, climbing through the depths towards the light beyond the waves. Braving the darkness and during the cold it went, until at long last it reached her. The one who created it, the one who called it into the world. Tentatively, almost fearfully, it inched forth. Touching her lightly, swaddlingly, swaddling her softly, it held her with care and delicacy. However, something was wrong. The warmth it remembered was not there, unmoving, unbreathing. Life did not beat within her chest. It quivered. The tendrils held, holding her lost in their steadiness. I gotta clear my throat again. God dang. Oh my god. The tendrils holding their lost, her lost their steadiness. It had come too late. On the cusp of reuniting at last, she had been taken away. Nothing. At that realization, it could do nothing. It's so unable to do anything else. It howled, it roared, it screamed. For the one that had called it into existence. For the one it could not save. Hmm. It happened suddenly and without warning. Dozens of tendrils lancing, lancing through the air. They came to an abrupt stop. And a cry unlike any other shook the ship. Mournful, raw, it sat me on my sh all my strength, brought me to my knees. Leaden, listless, I lifted my head, watching blankly as the tendrils turned their tips. Began to gouge into themselves in a mad frenzy, thorns of red, painting the hall. 
painting the world. Somehow I saw it grow dull. Even in its dying throes, it continued to scream, wailing, protesting, until the very end. Hmm. When it was finally over, the pool of blood was all that remained. Bracing against my blade, I tried to and rise to my feet, but was unable to bear the strain. My legs gave give out beneath me. My wounds were severe, the pain unrelenting, yet somehow it felt dim, ebbing at the edge of my consciousness. Dragging myself through the blood, I used a wall to support myself as I staggered to my feet. Stumbling forward, unknowing, unsteadily, I went. To the place that she waited. She was right before me now. She was right there. So why? Why did it feel like she wasn't? It was the same as always. Unmoving, her eyes shut, awaiting the day she would awaken once more. Yet, I knew that day would never come. I had known for a long time, perhaps since the moment I first laid eyes on her, or since she first held me in a fleeting dream. I knew, and yet I still, still ha I had hoped. There was no name for me to call out. She had never been given one. A mechanical string of numbers and letters. To the people she offered everything to. That was all she amounted to. Born into this world and torn from it. Without ever being able to call her life her own. For this be how it ended. I... At that moment a pinging noise sounded through, through the air. Arrival at destination confirmed. Atmospheric conditions verified suitable for human habitation. Novage, Mondo, observation dome deploying. A click and a deep rumbling. I watched as the ceiling began to, above began to part. At first I didn't realize what I was looking at. A blinding brilliant blue, unlike any I had ever seen. It burned into my retinas, rousing something deep and primordial within me. Far above, a glowing orb cast its warmth upon me, as if holding me, as if hugging me. Humanity's last heaven. Sanctuary for the lost. I've watched it alone. The one who brought this world about. The one who, was give, who gave us this shining, radiant sky. She was right here. Right in my, here in my arms. And yet, yet... It crushed me, made the air in my lungs thin. Ah, ah. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't give form to the words that would carry it all away. Ah, please. Uh. Ah! <laughs> ah! <laughs> and so I simply screamed at the blindingly blue sky, whose gentle rays cut deeper into me than any blade. Ah! Bleeding, unable to breathe. It, it was all I could do. All I could do to keep from falling apart. Made with Rimpy. Scenario and director, I can't pronounce the name, so I'm just gonna let you guys read these, but thanks for watching as always guys, hopefully you made it to the end, this story was amazing, it was not near as sad as the first one, it did not have, it, it had one really sad part, but I didn't cry in this one, thankfully, but yeah, I love these games, they're so well written, and oh, it's just amazing, I was kind of ho hoping for like, more information about like, after what was happening in the first one, but this is more like a prologue, which is kind of weird because the first one had a lot of flashbacks too. I still don't know what's... I gotta look up who Notella was or whoever the vo name was he said at the end. I want to know more about the girl that's like in her own conscious. I wonder if she's living the same life that L627 whatever it was was living before she died. Except probably less painful maybe. I don't know. Uh, there's still a lot of mystery to this universe but it was a really well made game. Definitely worth the five bucks. Thank you for making the game, and I hope you guys enjoyed the video as always.
Oh, that was a lot of reading, boy.